off we go. Thank you everyone for being here today. Um, today's CNCF live webinar, delivering optimal out of box experiences. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm gonna read our code of conduct and then hand over to Bob Monkman, open source strategist at Intel and, and team. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to speak as an attendee, but there is a chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct and be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF Online Programs page. They will also be available on your registration link and in our Online Programs YouTube playlist. So with that, I will hand things over to Bob and crew and you'll have Libby, a great thank chat. You. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. And thanks everybody for joining this morning. I'm Bob Monkman, uh, open source strategist for Intel based in California. I've got with me today um, Petr Torre, principal engineer, and Daniel Ugarte, product manager, uh, technical product manager. And uh, so we're going to we're going to give an overview today of uh, network platform reference architectures and how they deliver um, uh, out of the box productivity for cloud native application uh, development. So without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna give a, a little bit of a setup, an overview of how we're making that happen. And then Petar and Daniel are going to give us some very specific industry use case examples. And then we're gonna wrap it up and have some time for Q and A at the end. All right, without further ado, let me share my screen. I'm actually going to I'm going to I'm going to stop my video so I don't distract while I'm presenting. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, is that working? Now here we go. There we go. I'm just familiarizing myself with this tool. All right, very good. So um, again, uh, out of box productivity delivered by. Uh, uh, reference system architectures, and we're going to have a particular focus on uh, communication infrastructure systems in that sector. But um, let's let's just go uh, through a little bit of setup first. So, I mean, some of the trends that we're seeing in network infrastructure, of course, are the the cloudification of everything. Everything's connected to the cloud. Um, there's data masses mass amounts of data going in and out of the cloud. Um, 5G adoption is here now, and the, the, uh, the service providers in this space are also following this trend and beginning to adopt cloud, cloud native principles, uh, work in sort of hybrid, uh, you know, on-prem and, and cloud environments, and service agility becomes a really key factor in this uh, in this new sort of environment, the, the 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 need to or the requirement from customers to meet market demands, delivering new service services in minutes, ideally instead of months. And then, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, now that we're connected uh, to everything out there, and you have the Internet of Things, you have intelligent systems, uh, millions and billions of intelligent systems out there. It's not just a one-way management and data transfer out to the edge. We've got volumes of data coming in. And really what you're seeing is the burden of orchestration and management is really becoming beyond the capabilities of humans to manage. So you're uh, uh, alone. So you're seeing the, the advent of AI and, and machine learning to help to orchestrate, to schedule, to manage these systems. And furthermore, we're seeing this, this move to you know, cloud native design and microservices um, design and implementation of those services. Uh, some of the market data that we're seeing and, and the conversations that we'd have with cloud service providers 
and uh, service uh, software as a service vendors out there is that um, over the next couple of three years, we're going to see 80% or more uh, experts uh, uh, predict uh, software done in a cloud native and microservices implementation. So that's a massive shift, very rapid shift. And it's really happening across multiple sectors. And today we're going to focus more on, you know, comms infrastructure, because um, that's where we have some particularly um, interesting examples today. But it really applies broadly across um, uh, a broad swath of sectors. And this really has a significant impact on the technology building blocks that are relevant, the way that software is built, the way that software is assured, and the way that software is delivered. And as I said earlier, we really have this, this massive uh, complexity um, and this need for AI and ML to help uh, get us to a point where you have, uh, you see, see the advent and the emergence of uh, concepts like zero touch automation aided by AI and machine learning. Now in the network transformation uh, space in particular, when we look at uh, the applications across the continuum of edge back into the cloud, there are some unique challenges that have always been there. Reality is that, that this sector in particular has to deal with. And, um, I'm not going to you know, sort of rattle them all up, but you can sort of see them here. And we're working with all the leading vendors, the ISVs, the service providers, system integrators, and, and, and others to comprehend these challenges, and some of which are introduced with these new technologies that were not necessarily designed with all of these challenges in mind. You know, when we work with these ecosystem players and leverage our deep insight into how software executes and how data moves across the system to identify bottlenecks and gaps. And then we work with these players to mitigate these issues and deliver enhancements to the open source communities, our partners and our customers. But you know, all of these point optimizations that we can achieve and deliver through these open source communities are only part of the solution. And our topic today is centered on how can we take this work one step further and deliver highly integrated, well-documented reference system architecture to the market that helps speed deployment of new infrastructure and services that can be built with these optimized solutions. So let's take a closer look at that. So here you see this um, sort of introduction uh, to the Intel network platform. And the idea here is it's, it's really a, a, an offering that is geared towards easing and accelerating this network transformation. It, it addresses these challenges by delivering software and hardware innovation and adoption tools that enable the ecosystem of vendors and service providers to leverage them and deliver these services much more rapidly. So on the left-hand side, we see hardware and a broad range of software optimizations in different areas uh, that mitigate some of these challenges that we discussed on the previous slide. And then we combine that with a variety of adoption tools that help developers quickly onboard and ramp up their applications on these reference systems, uh, including uh, uh, documentation uh, and collateral we call experience kits, which we're going to go into more detail um, later on, on in the presentation. And of course, we work, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we're working with the ecosystem of customers and partners in this space across the spectrum of, of the edge to the cloud to ensure that the, this integration and the wealth of productivity aids around that software are really vastly improving the out-of-box experience for the developers, accelerating that time to market, accelerating that time to revenue. So if we take a little bit of a deeper look at the specific innovations and optimiz optimizations that we deliver uh, inherently into these reference systems, 
it, it comes in different buckets. And so we're, again, we're leveraging the deep insights from running and analyzing representative workloads uh, and combining those insights with Intel's unique silicon capabilities, as well as general software optimizations um, to deliver better performance, lower latencies, uh, cut jitter and close security gaps. And all of these uh, land in the reference system architectures along with the vast portfolio of experience kits that we deliver with them to deliver this productivity and this value proposition. It's really, a, it, and, and again here, if you look at some of the details, I'm, I won't go through all of them, but this, this is measured in terms of, you know, things like crypto acceleration, uh, compression acceleration, transactions per, per second across, uh, you know, uh, 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 remote procedure calls, service mesh optimization, service mesh in particular is a really uh, powerful way to connect microservices, but it comes with a lot of overhead. So we've, we've found and, and implemented a great deal of optimizations to, to mitigate that overhead. Um, we've done a lot of work in the areas of scheduling and optimal workload replacement, uh, telemetry, um, security, security gaps, uh, protecting keys, uh, isolating, uh, certificate authorities in multi-tenancy environments, so on and so forth. And again, pulling this all together um, into these reference systems for high productivity. So really what we're delivering to the marketplace is a, is a set of these cloud native reference system blueprints, if you will, optimized for, for native uh, development, bare metal type environment, uh, private cloud, public cloud deployments, and continually uh, updating and innovating the various open source building blocks that make up this reference platform and working in those communities to get these uh, optimizations upstreamed, working with customers and the, the, um, the relevant top of stack software vendors to get these downstreamed into the, uh, the popular uh, stacks out there and making sure that it's all very well integrated, validated uh, with uh, a product, you know, operators and other deployment automation tools that make it easy to um, sort of onboard this stuff and accelerate that to development and deployment of your applications um, on these, uh, you know, network infrastructure um, uh, uh, solutions out there in the marketplace. If we take yet another deeper look at this, um, it's not just one sort of one size fits all reference system architecture, because as you're well aware, there's um, at least three fundamental operating environments that people are deploying these cloud native applications in. We have you know, sort of native bare metal uh, on physical hardware uh, deployments, uh, typically on-prem, we have some, you know, virtual machine uh, in configurations and environments often in, in the private cloud. And then of course, uh, more and more we're seeing applications, software services written for and deployed in the, in the cloud instances uh, from the major cloud service providers. And each of these reference architectures are designed from the ground up to accommodate um, and address these unique, the unique environmental considerations of these uh, different uh, environments. And again, it, it's all very well integrated, validated, uh, Kubernetes managed, uh, there's quarterly releases, uh, experience kits delivered with them. And we're, we're gonna give you some, some details as to what those experience kits entail in upcoming slides. And then within, even within those deployment models, um, if we take a closer look, what, did, what does that really mean? If you look, this is just really just a, a visual depiction of you know, what the bare metal, the virtual machine reference architecture and the cloud reference architecture uh, might look like. 
And it just gives you a sort of a visual sense of on the left hand side here, we have uh, a, a bare metal uh, cluster uh, deployment here on individual servers. Uh, down in the sort of bottom of these each of these boxes is a node, a physical server, right? Control nodes, worker nodes that make up the Kubernetes cluster. In the middle, you have virtual clusters. Um, this is just showing a single node, but it should be noted that um, you know this in this environment, this configuration certainly does support um, multi multi nodes, uh, virtual machine deployments across multiple nodes. And then, of course, on the on the right hand side, you have uh, this particular example here is an AWS uh, EKS. Uh, instance environment and all of the necessary considerations and support for that kind of environment are built into this particular reference architecture. So the reference architecture concept and deliverables are very really flexible, providing you know, options for these multiple modern you know, network deployment types. And then within those different uh, environments, uh, we actually have created a lot of very specific, what we call configuration profiles. And what that entails is a very specific hardware and software bill of materials, a manifest, if you will, specifically for certain workloads or application requirements. The application requirements, the stack um, is going to be different for uh, RAN elements versus, um, you know, versus transport elements versus the core of a 5G network, if you will. So this is just one sort of example in the network infrastructure space where we can simplify that journey and, and add even more, uh, you know, sort of out of the box productivity by having you know, predefined very specific recipes that are highly uh, designed and characterized for that particular application. And of course, um, in the right-hand side, if you look uh, in the box on the right, there's actually a way for you to actually build your own uh, configuration profile, create your own software bomb uh, that's very specific to your environment. If the, if the uh, you know, pre-assembled uh, configuration profiles aren't exactly what you need, you can always, you know, create your own. And earlier I mentioned that it's not just the software integrated reference platform uh, that's delivered here. We have this notion of experience kits as well. And so the experience kit, again, is, is it's really a, a, a library of documentation, how-to guides, training that provide best practices, step-by-step -step instructions and development guidelines for each of the you know, technology areas that are found in the reference architecture. And also, you know, again, tuned to the particular type of application uh, that they're designed to address. And these are, you know, available uh, with the, you know, you can go and actually download the experience kits themselves along with the reference architectures. And, you know, this, this, this uh, presentation, this webinar is recorded and these links can take you there. Uh, so when you uh, view the recording later, uh, you'll be able to go to these links and, and actually examine these experience kits and see what's in them. But this is a big part of the puzzle. It's not just throwing software optimizations at you. It's giving you these integrated packages with the guidelines, with the training, with the step-by-step -step instructions on how to use all of the various elements within the reference architecture. So with that, um, that's sort of a broad overview of how we're delivering that out-of-the-box experience for developers. I'd like to turn it over to Petr Torre, uh, cloud uh, architect, uh, principal engineer who works in our field organization. Petter has worked with um, some partners and um, service providers 
to put together a particular multi-cloud orchestration use case example using these reference architectures. Petter, I'm gonna let you go through that and, and show folks how you demonstrate how you've applied that uh, for the specific use case. Hey, thanks, Bob. So so next three slides in about eight to 10 minutes, I will explain how did we look at compute intensive workload in multi and hybrid cloud environment. And there we paid special attention to satisfying the key principles where we would like to do it multi-cloud, meaning across multiple different environments. And obvious consequence of that is as we are trying to do it, we should not be using single environment tooling that will not work on the next environment. And this is where uh, previously mentioned reference architectures are really helping. And as we wanted to have an outcome that in real world would also have easy life cycle and uh, easy onboarding, we need to be careful as we are layering the stack in the sense that we don't unconsciously create undesired uh, linkages and dependencies and actually uh, bring this thing into combination that is very hard to decouple. Now, this example here, we have, uh, let's start, for example, from the bottom. We have consistent hardware platform in AWS region and on-premises in form of uh, Intel Xeon CPUs with particular CPU instructions that will help us. And then next level of consistency is to have a Kubernetes environment with particular features. And here we will look at uh, node feature discovery that is giving us uh, details of uh, underlying software and hardware platform. And where supported, we can also enable next level of features that are useful for compute intensive workload that is coming here, which is uh, CPU pinning with uh, static policy for kubelet for CPU manager. And while we do know how to do that in case of uh, EKS, uh, this is still to be all documented and supported. So for example, uh, like it is on uh, Azure AKS, where we are also doing it. Now, running the Monte Carlo as an example, compute intensive workload uh, coming from uh, financial services industries vertical, being used a lot over there for various risk management. That workload is based on vector instructions. And this is where different implementation in hardware plays big difference. And the application is then packaged as uh, pod can be scheduled over Kubernetes. And on top, we have a policy uh, driven orchestration in form of Cloudify with uh, Tosca blueprints. So the exercise that brings us to this multi part of cloud is uh, to make sure that across different environments, we have minimum inconsistency and maximum in common in Tosca blueprints, of course, the pod is the same and uh, different uh, ways of building Kubernetes environments are very consistent. And this is all also documented. You have the paper here for further reading. And if you could move to next slide, this is uh, visualizing how we built the stack. So in this example here, we will have a uh, benefit of the reference architectures under the hood it's going to create terraform templates from those templates we will go and apply them and uh, get hold of appropriate eks kubernetes managed service and uh, appropriate uh, ec2 instances and here for purpose of comparison, we will take the current compute instances with uh, third generation Xeon and then the previous uh, Xeon also to compare it to. 
and in those CPUs we have different vector instructions that are either the current is uh, AVX512 or the previous is AVX2. They are 512 or 256-bit width and uh, based on that we will see different performance. The workload is uh, built using appropriate Intel tools like uh, compilers that will produce binaries that uh, take advantage of all the hardware accelerations available there. And uh, then we will see how long does it take to run the simulation and uh, we will then uh, send the metrics into the reporting little subsystem consisting of uh, Prometheus and Grafana and we will observe it in Grafana. Now this uh, Cloudify orchestrator on top is uh, driving all of the bits on the bottom so we can have blueprint to create uh, environment using Terraform and another one then on top of it uh, to schedule something over Kubernetes and there is the flow fully automated execution of all of that to apply or to destroy or if we go further to do other actions on it and if we look at the result of when we build something like that uh, being if you move to the next slide so so all of that being automated it's easy to create different instances all within the same cluster and also to deploy different versions of this monte carlo uh well actually it's the same pod which is different uh, uh environment variables so it knows how to run and what to do and uh, we can observe that for example we have so, so lower is better here. This is elapsed time to complete the simulation of particular size. And we can observe two benefits coming here. One is that uh, uh, generational improvements, the current instances, so C6i or, or equivalent that is coming with third generation Xeon, Ice Lake uh, is the code name, are faster than the previous ones for this type of uh, workloads both running in AVX2 version and AVX512. And generally, when we run uh, just compute workloads that are not using vector instructions also, uh, we observe similar. And then uh, this workload really correlates with the size of uh, those, uh, the width of those vectors. And because 512 is double the 256, we see that uh, the workload runs two times faster when we enable it with AVX 512 compared to AVX 2. And uh, we see this about 2x consistent uh, on current generations or on previous generations. And this directly equates uh, results in uh, reduced time to use the instances or uh, reduce cost of those instances of the compute time. And uh, this was our example. And with that, we will move to Daniel, who will explain a little, not little, but way more complicated example than just a compute intensive one, please. Petter, thanks for that great example. I'll turn it over to Daniel. Yes, hi, uh, this is Daniel Ugarte. So I'll be presenting uh, the, the application of the BMRA, the bare metal reference architecture to the VRAN and our FlexRAN, Intel's FlexRAN solution. Can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, let's just start by uh, explaining uh, what is VRAN and, or, and or FlexRAN. So this is part of the uh, 5G network and the VRAN, it's the uh, the radio access node, it's been used as the base station. This is what handles the physical layers for the wireless, uh, for the wireless media and uh, all the way to the control layer um, in the, in the, in the 5G network. Now, uh, what is the reference architecture doing here? So, if you see on the left, so uh, Bob, Bob mentioned the, the configuration profiles. So 
this is an example of what the configuration profile for the VRAN is, right? So basically, it's a, it's a representation of all software in, in ingredients that we have from the network, from one of our teams, from the network platform teams. Uh, we cherry pick out of everything that is available. We cherry pick the, the specific ingredients that the Flex run uh, or that the VRAN team needs, right? Um, this becomes the reference architecture configuration profile. It is basically, if you see, it's an abstraction of what the what the requirements, the software platform requirements, software and hardware platform requirements from for the from the VRAN. Um, if you see at the top, uh, there are different buckets. Let's say that okay, Kubernetes uh, has many different features. And we turn on a subset of these features for Kubernetes, for service mesh, for security, for power management. And we go all the way down to the uh, hardware and inter uh, the mix you know, operating system and so on, right? So this is the bomb, the bill of materials uh, that uh, was presented previously. Now, the line, the, the green line that you see there implies that, that those are our choices, right, for the needed for the VRAN. If you move to the right, what we have here is how does the flex run, so how does the reference architecture deploys this configuration profile, right? We use a set of Ansible scripts, Ansible playbooks um, that deploys a, a capabilities or these ingredients on a cluster wide base or a, or for um, the software the software that is required for the work, worker nodes or control nodes um, some of these capabilities yes they they are shared across all all nodes some of them are um, only in the in the in the worker node with the flex run application if we, this is, if you see, a, this is an optimized and validated, easy and fast way to deploy the VRAN reference system, right? Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So how, let's see how, how, how this is consumed, right? So at the bottom, you will see all our hardware um, selections uh, for, for VRAN or FlexRAN above you have all the green um, software ingredients, uh, platform software ingredients that are being used. And the reference architecture consists on in an installation playbook, right? A way to manage the configuration profile. And with this, you can um, uh, basically have different variants for different flavors of the, of the VRAN that you are being using. Um, and these, all of these have to be, uh, uh, I would say, curated. Uh, all the dependencies from one software uh, to another software are being examined, are being tested and integrated, right? Um, and that, that's part of the configuration profile management. So on the right side, this is a couple of things we did for our FlexRun team. It is that, um, we want customers to have um, to enjoy this easy way to deploy the this this network element, right? And not only that, we want them to see uh, see it in action. So uh, if there are um, tests that are standalone, they could deploy these test modes, right? To see in this case is the DU is part of the VRUN, run to see the D run the the D Sorry, the the DU uh, and flex run in action. They would see how that the, how does the layer one performs, right? And how does the layer one layer one performs with their NICs if they are connected to a um, to a radio simulator, right? So we have created a couple of profiles. Uh, one on the left side, you see a VRAN application. This is for any generic uh, VRAN. And on the right side will be for our flex run. Now, um, what do we do with this, right? So how, what is the, 
value add that we have. So as we say, okay, so we can engage uh, customers, okay? In the case of Intel, uh, we can reach um, uh, the customers with a, an early version of our um, of our silicon, right? Um, and so when uh, uh, customers receive these early versions of hardware, they could see the flex run in action and and see uh, how um, uh, what performance improvements they have, right? So it's a way to engage the the, the customers earlier on. Um, another way to to use the reference architecture is so if partners would like to start testing, right, and they have a more complicated test uh, to perform. The reference architecture is the first step where they receive a pre-verified, already verified uh, software platform and uh, software and hardware platforms. And, um, and they can check that everything is in place, that they have the right um, versions, the right configurations all over the system, and then uh, start their testing. And this will uh, reduce uh, a lot of the uh, overhead produced uh, when um, a customers or partners have to verify every single little thing in the recipe that they are using. Um, uh, finally, if you're not using the test modes, uh, you could use it uh, to deploy the, the DU network element over the 5G network um, uh, for, a, for an end-to-end -end setup. Right, and this is beneficial when you have tests, uh, in-house testing uh, in your labs or even uh, at the customer side. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. So, how does the reference architecture evolve over time? Right. So, this is an example of what we call a capability. A capability is basically. Um, the um, the bundle of different software ingredients that uh, provide one uh, system property or system behavior. Let's say you have you can have a capabilities uh, or one capability could be security, another capability could be power management. In the case of the uh, Flexran uh, uh, application, uh, we have the power management capability and these are a series of optimizations in different pieces of software in different across different layers of the stack now um so many much of this capability or already exists and it's been uh, moving from one generation to the next right but uh in this case uh our new software rapids they have optimizations for how to um, send um, um, our course to sleep for um, to reduce the power consumption. So there are different instructions uh, provided to different layers all the way to the application layer. So the application is in control of, um, of how to send this, this, um, this course to sleep. Uh, so in the case of Sapphire Rapids, yes, there, there are new states that are being used at the DPDK um, and with different boot settings, and that's provided to the FlexRun application, right? And uh, yes, so so you will see improvements uh, when moving from one generation to the next. Um, can we go to the next uh, slide, please? OK, so this is a summary slide. Uh, so we have the, what is the reference system architecture? Is it a total product offering is available for you to explore and leverage for new developments on network deployments. The reference architecture systems provides, uh, provides you with a validated workload optimized and easy to consume reference to accelerate, accelerate your uh, time to market. Uh, if you want to download the experience kits, uh, you can follow you can click on these uh, links. They will explain the capabilities that we have developed um, and the user guide and how to develop um, 
sorry, how to how to use and deploy the reference architecture. Um, and if you have any feedback or questions, you can contact yeah. our reference architecture team um, to, to Dana Nihama or myself, Daniel Ugarte, and these are our emails. And with this, uh, we conclude the presentation and um, we are open to uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Great uh, example for the video. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, be sure into the chat so we can get to the let me go to that window and see if I've got some particular I don't see any I don't see any particular questions like I, I uh, keyed up uh, keyed up in the chat uh, like how can we how can we focus uh, Going twice. Uh, well, thank you all so much for coming together, Bob, and doing dinner for all of us. Um, get that later today. So welcome to catch it there. Uh, or find it on our YouTube channel. And uh, thank all of y'all for another CNCF live webinar and um, thank you all so much. Thanks very much, Libby. And thanks to our, my fellow presenters and Libby, uh, you'll send us a link.